Um, so I want to welcome everybody to our Palaver series. Um, today we should have a really exciting discussion. I'm really actually um, excited to hear it. Um, so to get us started, we're going to have our chair, the chair of the African Studies Department, come and do um, some welcome remarks, and then we'll have an introduction of the speaker um, by one of our graduate students, Camille Dantzler. Dr. Chan. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. And uh, <clears throat> thank you all for coming out to <clears throat> be with us this afternoon for a really exciting event. Um, <clears throat> we are very proud and honored to be able to welcome home one of our own, uh, because uh, Wendy actually is one of our distinguished alumni. She was here with us back in about 2013, about two years ago when we celebrated our 60th um, uh, <coughs> anniversary of the establishment of the graduate program. Since she left Howard here, she's been really doing some stellar work and it's really a pleasure to welcome her back here at Howard with uh, her new baby, so to speak. <laughs> uh, one among many illustrious ones, actually. You know. um, so welcome back home, uh, Wendy. And uh, we look forward to a really um, uh, exciting session. I also want to welcome back <laughs> uh, somebody who was here with us at Howard for a very, very long time, who just popped up this afternoon. And it's really quite a pleasant surprise to have him here with us. That's Dr. Alphaba, who uh, <laughs> uh, is a Howard product here and a uh, very close uh, colleague of uh, Wendy, who uh, is coming back to us from Liberia after spending so many years in Liberia. And uh, is actually going back to uh, Liberia on Friday, so uh, uh, it was quite a coincidence that um, this event is taking place and is able to reconnect with her classmate and colleague, uh, Dr. Wilson here. So thank you very much for coming and um, thank you all for uh, agreeing to be a part of this uh, event, Dr. Bond, who is always uh, very, very helpful, a key uh, part of our Center for African Studies here at Howard University, and also my faculty colleagues, students, um, everybody present here. So uh, thank you very much, and enjoy the afternoon. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I am Camille Danza. It's been said before. I'm a current doctoral student in the department. And I've been given the honor of introducing Dr. Wendy wilson Fall this afternoon. To begin, uh, Dr. wilson Fall earned her PhD from Howard University's African Studies Center with a concentration in social anthropology. I don't know if you've been by the department, but we have a wall here up there. Um, and her, M her MA from Amadou Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. Dr. wilson Fall is an associate professor and program chair of the Africana Studies Program at Lafayette College. She has previously served as chair and associate professor of the Pan-African Studies Department at Kent State University. Dr. Wilson Fall has received numerous awards from the African Development Foundation and National Science Foundation. Her research engages questions of sociocultural change, ethnic identity, and multifocal historical narratives. She has published numerous journal articles and book chapters addressing these themes in the context of nomads in West Africa and about the African diaspora of the US. Dr. Wilson Fall's new book, Memories of Madagascar and Slavery in the Black Atlantic, explores African American and family narratives about Madagascar and the historical context in which they were produced. Dr. Wilson Fall is currently president of the West African Research Association and also serves on the advisory board of the HNET Slavery Matrix, supported by Michigan State University. She is currently working on a timely piece about black culture in the United States and relations between African Americans and African immigrants. So with these wonderful accomplishments in mind, we invite you to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would first of all like to thank everyone for such a warm welcome, uh, particularly to Professor Bai Chang, who's the chair here. 
uh, to the professors whom I recognize and who meant so much to me when I was a student, um, and to the Howard community in general. Howard will always, of course, mean quite a lot to me. So it's a very special experience to be here with you and to be able to talk with you a little bit about one of my latest projects. So thank you very much for your hospitality and for coming to uh, talk about this book with me. Um, I would like to add a little context about uh, how this book fits in with the kinds of things I'm interested in now. And that is that I think, uh, at least for me, and I hope for others, it provided a window on the problem of diversity in the black community in the United States. And um, for me, it highlighted some of the issues that the African American community in the United States has faced from very early on. Because as we all know, um, this community is characterized by uh, continuous waves of arrivals of people from Africa, uh, right from the beginning, and in particular from the 18th to uh, really the mid-19th century, uh, there were always new people arriving uh, from the African continent, although they were not arriving voluntarily. So I think we often forget that the African American community uh, has um, been its own melting pot in a way, and that its character is really shaped by the fact that uh, within almost every third generation, more people have come from someplace in West or Central Africa and become somehow part of the African American community. Today, almost 20% of the black community in the US has one parent who is a black immigrant, at least one, if not two parents who are black immigrants from um, Africa or the Caribbean. So I hope that um, a work such as this will help us in the conversations we need to have about diversity in the black community. And I even go so far to say as the success of the black community in sustaining itself as a, as a healthy place. So how was I approaching my work? Uh, first of all, the study of the community histories of people living in a writing society, but originating from a non-writing society, is a particular kind of theoretical and practical challenge. You'll notice that I said writing society. I avoided saying literate society because I believe that there is such a thing as oral literacy. There is also cultural literacy. So I'm specifically here talking about the problem of how to do research in societies where there's not a deep writing culture. And of course, in many places in Africa, as everyone here knows, even in those places where people do have a writing tradition, it doesn't mean everybody writes. So when we look at issues of power and um, class and rank, it's important to remember that even in writing societies, including the United States today, everybody does not write well or write at all. So how do we approach those histories? How do we learn about those communities that are not neatly tucked into the archives? So alternative histories, therefore, the volume uh, has uh, brought up a lot of interesting um, data and besides what I talked about within the book, which I will talk about, it has also illuminated for me the importance of black sailors. And uh, one of the things that I have found very um, frustrating, I mean, I don't know if any of you have heard of a book called Black Jacks by Jeffrey Bolster, which is a black, about black sailors. But when you try to learn about people of African descent in mainland North America, before um, pretty much 1900, their ethnicities are never mentioned. They've already been masked by this massive racial classification system that we have. You don't know who's Jamaican, who's from Trinidad, who's from Bermuda, who may be Yoruba, how many of the sailors may have been from Madagascar. So even Jeffrey Bolster's book, which was fabulous, and one of the first of its kind 
all of the sailors are black sailors. And if you study African-American history, you will know that in 1805, it was impossible for all the people in the African-American community, certainly at least a third of those people would have had an African parent or grandparent. It's not as though black people weren't living in the same communities and talking with each other. How could they all mysteriously have become these anonymous black people? So um, I'm also pushed by um, what I feel is a response to the fabulous work that's been done by historians. Um, I think it's in the field of history and also in archaeology a little bit, also in the arts, uh, where people have really done incredible research about existence in African communities, about exchanges between African American communities and African continental uh, communities. Uh, most of the what we know now about African Americans has come from historians. So. Um, I'm fortunate that Michael Gomez wrote the introduction to my book, so I'm mentioning him, but also Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, um, uh, many other authors, uh, Lorena Walsh, for example, in Williamsburg. These are people who've gone so far as to tell us that now in the United States, you know which ethnic groups predominated in which parts of the United States. You can no longer say, oh, we don't know. You know, nobody knew anything. It was the Tower of Babel. All the Africans were divided. They couldn't speak to each other. These things need to be put into the realm of folklore, which is what they are. And when you look at the work also of, um, I want to say, in um, at Toronto, Paul Lovejoy, of the wonderful work that Ana Araujo is doing, for example, in Brazil and her colleagues, what Thornton did. Um, so much work, historical work has been done on the demographics and the geographics of the American African diaspora. And even in North Africa, for that matter, now, Ismail Montana, uh, Omar Boom, and others are working on uh, sub Saharan African diasporas in North Africa. Unfortunately, the social scientists are way behind. And the cultural studies people are way behind. So we still have a tradition here where our tradition is to count things about black people. And most of the things that we are counting are in the context of dysfunction. So how many black people don't finish high school? How many black people are alcoholics? How many black people go to church? How many black people beat their children? How many black people are drug addicts? But we don't have any ethnographic studies of African Americans, as we do even in the Caribbean. How do African Americans view God? Not what religion are they, but how does God function in their world? What are the beliefs African Americans have when they're raising children? What do African Americans think of older people? What are the folk beliefs in the 21st century about illness? Nobody is studying any of those things. So African Americans are, in fact, a very understudied group of people. Um, you could compare, for example, the studies that have been done of Native Americans at the turn of the century with Morgan and others in the early days of anthropology, where uh, people visited Native American villages and they wrote everything down. Oh, look, he turned left. I wonder what that means. Oh, he stooped down. That must be really heavy, you know? But nobody has done that about African Americans because they have been uh, sort of, in the, in the French term, banalisé. It's just so banal, it's so in front of you that people don't occur, it doesn't occur uh, to our scholars that this is a particular cultural process that's right in front of us that has its own internal logics. Um, and so what I was interested in was those eter internal logics. The book starts out with um, a woman in St. Mary's, uh, Maryland. And I'm just going to read the first uh, sentence or so. In 1796, a woman reported to be a slave managed to bring a court case regarding her captivity in Maryland. In the case, 
Negro Mary versus the Vestry of William and Mary's Parish of October 1st, 1796. The petitioner claimed to be the daughter of a woman who had been captured in Madagascar a generation before, enslaved in North America on her arrival. It's astounding from a contemporary point of view that a woman slave in 1796 would be so well informed regarding British law. Nevertheless, on the basis on the, of the former status of her mother, the enslaved woman in Maryland argued that she should be set free. Madagascar, she said, was not a place from which slaves usually were brought. Her point of view was that Madagascar and thus Malagasy people should not be considered as legally imported labor as in the normal course of the slave trade. It was true that under the New East India Act of 1721, American colonists could no longer le legally obtain East India goods unless through Britain. Unfortunately for Mary, the judge ruled that she could be set free only if she could provide documentation of the original status of her mother. Having thus responded, the judge cleverly avoided the question of whether out-of-bounds slavery in Madagascar was a sufficient charge for changing slave status. He knew it would have been exceedingly uncommon for a person such as the enslaved plaintiff to produce papers documenting her claim. <laughs> so um, what happened? How did Mary get there? And why was she still talking about being from Madagascar. Well, between 1719 and 1721, about um, the latest figure is 1,600 slaves from Madagascar were brought into Tidewater, Virginia. And um, they were, that's a very large number of people to, who sh to share the same language in any slave coffle. And beyond that, um, it's a very large number of people to arrive from the same place of embarkation to the same region in any country. I mean, you find that in Brazil, for example, uh, during different periods for the Yoruba, uh, as an example, or people from the Congo. So um, my concern was to try to track this process because I believe that the United States should be studied just as Brazil should be studied or just as Jamaica should be studied if we're talking about the African diaspora. This is not to minimize at all the study of African Americans, but to get to the point where we can see African Americans as a community and a constellation of communities of African descent in the Americas, and to begin to grapple with what people call North American monumentalism. Uh, it's my belief that this North American mon monumentalism continues to isolate African Americans. Uh, because they have, a, or we have a very unique history that includes both colonization and another sort of um, what I call a citizen on probation status, ongoing probationary status. So um, this is the picture of the great great grandmother of someone that I was uh, interviewing, whose uh, ancestors lived in Virginia, and she was kind enough. Uh, to share this photograph with me. This is her great, great, great uh, grandmother, Felicia. Here you can see the Rebecca Snow, which is one of the ships uh, that went to Madagascar. So one of the um, very important things about how people retained this identity, or even the idea of the identity, I'll say, is because you had sort of a critical mass of people who landed in a fairly limited geographic space. And when they arrived, uh, the three most important um, planters of the region bought more than 40% of the Malagasy. So Robert King Carter, John Randolph, and William Waters bought, uh, were the major investors in that um, sort of adventurous business deal they had to go out to the Indian Ocean. So the people who are from Madagascar ended up belonging to a white Americans who themselves were marrying each other and who were involved in other kinds of exchanges of land and other commodities. 
So this uh, increased the probability that the people from Madagascar would see each other on a regular basis. And you're going to see a map um, a little later which will show you how these houses were clustered around the Rappahannock, uh, Potomac, and York Rivers in Virginia. Uh, this is another couple, Lucy Ann and John Clark, who live in Hanover and Ashland, who lived in Hanover and Ashland, Virginia, and who were settled by Quakers uh, in a free uh, black neighborhood called the Winston Estates. Um, both sides of the family claim that uh, they are descended uh, from these two people who were from, they say were from Madagascar. So um, this woman, Lucy Ann, has been found in the archives. She arrived when she was about 16 years old. I think it was 1836. We don't have a record of John Clark arriving, but we do have family stories in which he said, for example, he danced his way across the Atlantic. So, so we don't know, was he dancing as a, you know, there was a whole art form that preceded Broadway, that preceded um, what we think of as blackface that was going on at, at that time. So we don't know if he was performing or if he was dancing because he was a gentleman dancing uh, on deck, we don't know. But it, it really highlights one of the problems of this work. The people who arrived as slaves are documented because they were commodities or they were placed in the category of being co commodities. So we can find them in the diaries and the journals, in the correspondence of these big traders who talk about bringing them to their farms, bringing them from one farm to the other. Uh, there's somebody named Madagascar Jack that John Carter talks about often. Uh, there was a woman named Belinda who was a Malagasy woman that he gave to his daughter. So we have evidence of that. But here's the problem. As I worked on this, I realized that there were these other people who kept showing up from the 1830s. And they are not on the record. When I first uh, started running into these stories from the 1830s, I thought, in, in a rather arrogant way, I'm going to share uh, with you and the students here in particular, we can all make these sort of methodological mistakes. And here I am full of myself as an anthropologist listening to these stories. And when everybody kept going back to 1830 and 1840, I said, oh, you know, they're just getting confused. They don't know how to count the generations. But when I started finding this out in many different families and stories from many different parts of the United States, I had to admit there was something that I didn't know, something that was going on. So what I discuss in the book, I have two other categories. The first is people who came as smuggled slaves. Um, Obadele Starks says that um, up to about 12,000 Africans were smuggled into the United States between 1808 and 1865. Now, one of, the, one of the implications of that is that we immediately see that all African-American families cannot be the same, that it's an error to think that no African-American family might feel closer to Africa than another African-American family. Because we have no statistics, we have not done our own census work about when various families arrived into the United States. So I find that the Malagasy arrived either as servants or uh, there must have been a great number that were smuggled into probably Louisiana or Texas. Um, I have several narratives that I collected from various places in Texas and Louisiana of people who claimed Malagasy descent and all of them count back to the 1830s. None of them have any story that seems to go back any further than that. But neither are those stories very detailed. However, I would say that if now African Americans, at least 10 years ago, African Americans had basically a sixth grade reading level nationally, why would African Americans in the 1920s be walking around talking about Madagascar? Why would they even know where it is? Why would it even occur to them to talk about it? 
So um, I'm not going to go into all the details. It could get kind of tedious. Uh, but there is a group of people who seem to have been smuggled in. So whereas there is a record for um, the woman in the picture that you saw, there is no record for the man. And I think that's often because uh, people came in as servants to one individual or one family, so it wasn't really an importation, or they were smuggled in. These are other um, descendants of uh, the same family, the couple that you saw earlier. Uh, this is a good example of what I'm talking about here. You see, all of these, these are all plantations. And they're all clustered next to each other in the Tidewater region of Virginia. That means that their docks face each other. So each one of these plantations has a dock on the, their own dock on the river, facing a dock on the other side. So uh, you begin to understand the possibilities of communication for African captives on these plantations when you look at the geography and the topography of where they were. So most of them came in here, I think 400 came to York and about 1,000 were sent to the Rappahannock River. Uh, I'm sorry, this is sideways, but again, the important thing I want you to see is the density of plantations in this region in, and uh, how close they really were to each other, uh, both uh, in the mainland, if you are on the peninsula and facing each other, so that um, we know that a lot of the Africans were boatmen and operated boats. So uh, that should give us an idea of how they sustained uh, those skills and what it might have meant in terms of communication, and we'll go into that later. Uh, this is another example. Man Page, a very famous American, uh, a relative of Robert Carter's, uh, Landon Carter, uh, Van Meter, Harper's Ferry. This whole area uh, was settled in, in, a, in great part by the descendants of the first families of, of Virginia. Many of them moved to the West, and I found some stories uh, from the Western part of Virginia as well, such as the Bundys and the Danfridges. They also established quite a number of churches. So one of my questions is, uh, particularly for the Clark family, whether or not, um, because this was during the time of the Great Awakening when a lot of the uh, white Americans who belonged to the Church of England became Baptist. So you find that three of the stories uh, by the Malagasy have to do with being given churches or being assigned to run certain churches in the black community. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, um, an online connection, but if you copy that link, you will see that I've, done a, I've got a digital humanities project where we are tracking the location of the narratives that people told us, as well as the plantations and the location of uh, the stories from Free Malagasy. So Free Malagasy are my third category. I told you I had three. The first were the slaves who came from 1719 to 1721. The second category are those people who seem to have arrived as um, a sneak, uh, um, contraband, smuggled along the southern coast of the United States, probably Louisiana, Texas, and Florida. As you know, Cuba and Brazil got a special dispensation from England, and they were able to continue to import people up until the 1860s. So what people used to do is bring Africans, go to Cuba and get people from Africa, and then tell the authorities, oh, no, this thing, uh, no, my God, no, he's not from Africa. That guy's from Florida. And in that way, they were able to continue to being, bring people in uh, straight from Africa. So I already talked to you ab about um, 
some of my ideas about the how African Americans are understudied. But I want to explore the cultural meanings that are attributed to black folk utterances that have, been, have not been seriously considered in ongoing research. I want to ask whether an exploration of cultural practice and current ethnographic research can enhance our understanding of this population and its relationship to other communities and societies that have experienced the colonial. So I, uh, here I have to say I'm very emphasis by Ashil Mbembe, who talks about um, perceptions that we can have of Africa and normalizing Africa and Africans in our, in scholarly uh, perceptions, in the scholarly gaze. Uh, why must Africa always be special? Does not Africa have human beings and people like every place else. And I'd like to I like to turn that around and think about the types of methodologies that we would use uh, in a quotes field trip to Africa and use those same methodologies on a field trip to North Carolina. Why do we think that those types of inquiries and questions cannot be posed here? I think they're very political reasons that we have been conditioned to think that those questions are not appropriate in the United States. I think that currently most research puts emphasis on black relations to and position, positionality within the white majority culture, and much less emphasis on how black people from different regions interacted with each other. Um, I think of Ira Berlin, who a long time ago did an article called The Free Black Cast. And I love that article because he had the nerve to imagine that there were these different caste formations that were um, that were characterized by their geographic position and the type of regime of slavery and labor management in those different places. So um, how will research help us understand the convergence of the colonial and the color line, which are historically linked for African Americans in complicated ways. So these are sort of theoretical questions that I'm posing here and that which really pushed uh, my work on this book. In particular, I'm interested in regimes of truth and ways in which we have missed opportunities to understand African American history or histories as comprehended and assembled by African Americans themselves, particularly those outside of the academy. In other words, where is their truth? Um, and what do we do in the face, to go back to where I started, what do we do in the face of a gaping absence in the archives? Because um, the subaltern subject did not gather the archives. So uh, what do we do in that case if we want to be able to pronounce something about those experiences, those histories, and those lives. So um, I don't really perceive this work as uh, uh, really very far from my work in African studies because I'm trying to engage the same questions and the same problems about identity and change. And, um, I, and, and I would say the positionality of black subjects in the global, in the world, uh, so to speak. So um, it's true that the next thing I'm working on is um, sort of a collection of essays in which I will be trying to treat uh, issues of perception and communication between West Africans and African Americans. But then going further to say that I care, I care about this communication between West Africans and African Americans, but in looking at it, I learned that there are other issues that affect the positionality of African Americans with other ethnic groups in the United States, um, whether that's Cuban Americans or Ethiopians or Bosnians, for that matter. And so rather than trying to look at that from the outside, as in quotes, they don't like us or something like that, I'm trying to look at it from the inside. What is it that we don't like about them? 
And what is it that's difficult for us about interacting with people outside of our community as black Americans? And are we even aware of that uh, difficulty? So that's sort of the next thing that I'm working on. But sticking with the theme of liminality and marginality, um, I'm rather anxious to get back to the work that I did earlier, which was on nomads in West Africa, uh, particularly Fulani herders. And um, there I want to be able, again, to talk with young people from pastoral communities uh, and ask them how they see themselves in the 21st century. Um, I want to ask them what they're getting out of selling cell phones, um, what do they think about the projects that people are bringing them? What do they think, who do they, they feel they are in relation to people in the capital? Um, do, what do they see as the future of their communities? Uh, that's, that's what I wanna work on next. And so actually this afternoon, unfortunately it happened this afternoon, I'm gonna run to the World Bank to meet with somebody because they have a project, this immense project that runs from Chad to Senegal, uh, which is for West African pastoralists. And I think it's a good idea, but it's kind of alarming because their partners are herders federations, which means they are gonna have a direct line into all of these community organizations and um, voluntary associations that herders have established in Chad, Mali, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Senegal, and Mauritania. And of course, just coincidentally, this is happening at the same time that Al-Qaeda is presenting a problem in uh, the areas south of the Sahara that border the Sahelian grasslands. So I don't think that that is uh, coincidental. Um, I don't know if I really should talk anymore or um, invite some questions, but I'm gonna just share some of the things that I see are important uh, for diaspora research. One is, as I said, paying close attention to different regimes of truth. Uh, certainly in the West, uh, you know, um, I think, in, at least from my own experiences when in West Africa, uh, there's not very much self-consciousness in believing in your own history. Um, some young people may say, oh, he's exaggerating. But mostly you can go places where people say, I am this, I am this because of that, and that was because of my grandfather, and that's who I am. When you get to the West, and a black person tries to say that. Many black voices will respond, oh, come on, you know, what is, you making that up? What, what kind of word is that? Well, you don't know what he's talking about. Go back into the kitchen, you know? And so words that African Americans use, like bobo, like dig, which comes from Wolof, dig it, understand digana, dig, comes directly from Wolof, are discarded so that there's information that we are not even, that we may never get because as people are getting older, as African Americans become more integrated, uh, there are gonna be fewer and fewer people using those expressions. And unfortunately, we've lived in a political situation that leads us to disbelieve our own versions of ourselves. So I think that it's important to not be too much of an absolutist, to listen, even if you think it's wrong, until they're finished. <laughs> and then uh, there are many ways that you can triangulate that data or confirm that data through the archives and through talking to other people rather than shutting the person down um, as soon as you get there. And actually some people do that when they go do their field work abroad as well. So it's a sort of a useful thing to keep in touch. Also examining local histories in relation to most recent research, global and regional. Mbembe talks about this as well. Uh, so um, does, uh, what's, what's her name? Uh, I can't think of it right now. It's a historian actually of the Middle, middle Ages. But the argument is that um, 
those things which seem disconnected to you may only seem disconnected because you're not part of that community. So you're blind to certain circuits that are actually an operation. So you could go there and say, boy, these people, say you're in some place in West Africa, boy, these people know very little about the outside world. Oh, wow, look at that, they're sitting on a wooden bench. And imagine that that's the only truth, which is actually only your truth. And it's your truth because you're from the outside. So you don't, you're not privy to all the circuits that are going on. Just like I could go down the street and sit down and talk to somebody for half an hour about his grandparents from North Carolina and not know he's a dope dealer because I'm not from down the street. So uh, we have to listen carefully. And as I was just saying, test those kinds of me methodologies in multiple locales in more than one place, in more than one situation. And also, I have my own uh, interests. I'm especially interested in the work of James Ferguson, um, Achille Mbembe, and uh, Michel Rovetriot, of course, who was a Haitian-American uh, anthropologist who used to be at Hopkins. And they have influenced, uh, besides the wonderful professors who are here in the room, those uh, authors have also influenced me. So um, I've already pretty much said this. I don't think I need to re repeat myself here. And that's it. So thank you very much. So I would like to Thank Dr. Wilson Fall for that very informative. I, I remember looking at the title and really curious as what she was going to talk about um, in terms of Madagascar and the connection to the Black Atlantic. So I think that was a very, very enlightening um, presentation. And uh, the book, actually, I'm actually really excited about getting a chance to read that as well. Before we start Q and A, uh, we're going to have Dr. Helen Bond present some comments for the discussion. May I just interrupt by saying the book is available on Amazon. I'm sorry I don't have any here, but you can order it and it will arrive in. That's good. <laughs> and we have some uh, bookmarks here. We have some fine bookmarks that are available, so people can take those as well, which will help in your ordering process. And by the way, the book was excellent. Dr. Wendy Wilson Fall's presentation and book, Memories of Madagascar and Slavery in the Black Atlantic, are timely in many ways. Today is March 23rd, just two days shy from March 25th, the International Day of Remembrance for the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Established in commemoration of the memory of its victims by the General Assembly of the United Nations, and by the way, the 2016 theme is remembering slavery, celebrating the heritage and culture of the African diaspora and its roots. For over 400 years, more than 15 million men, women, and children were victims of the tragic transatlantic slave trade. The resolution called for the establishment of outreach programs to mobilize educational institutions such as ours, civil society, and other organizations to educate future generations of what we're doing here today of the causes, consequences, and lessons of the transatlantic slave trade, or as Toyin Falola, Nigerian historian, calls it, a social institution connected with commerce that produced a culture that manifested the intricacies and dangers of globalization before the word was even in existence. While Dr. Wilson Falls' uh, book certainly discusses how the Malagasy captives were caught in the grips of two major slaving networks, the Indian Ocean and the transatlantic slave trade. It began with a story, part of which you've already heard, of Negro Mary, and I won't recount on the amount of time. Uh, but as the author points out, Negro Mary invoked her pre-captive slave, her pre-captive status or identity as an exemplar of uniqueness or difference. While she lost her claim, she didn't lose her voice. 
as the author uses Negro Mary and her claim of Malagasy descent to frame the central questions and thesis of her book. As she writes, quote, my intent is to open a door to the New World slave experience that helps us better understand local histories of the diaspora and or of African Americans. And open the door she does. The door she opens is to a complex past. She uses historical documentation to provide context to oral traditions or family stories and memories of the sites, sounds, and places that keep Madagascar alive in her and other family traditions. She does this by following one particular thread that leads to Madagascar. But there are many threads, as she has discussed. Many doors that are reflected in this creolization process of the people we call African Americans. The special class of hyphenated Americans, a term that Theodore Roosevelt first used in 1915 in a controversial speech he gave to the Knights of Columbus in New York City, where he bellowed, there is no room in this country for hyphenated Americanism. The author examines the need for uniformity that has created boundaries for blackness. Unlike Teddy, she acknowledges the layeredness of identity and calls it a process of fusion. It is important to recognize that families in this book are not necessarily seeking authenticity, legitimacy, as they recognize they are not necessarily pure Malagasy, is there a pure anything, but of mixed heritage that happens to include an ancestor from Madagascar. This ancestor serves as a bridge to their unslaved past. Furthermore, the idea of an ancestral place or a homeland, if you will, gives individuals and families a sense of dignity and anchor against the sheer terror of displacement. This takes me back to my third grade classroom. Sunny windows, books on the desk, and a large map in the corner of the classroom. The assignment, still used today, is to go home and talk with your parents, your grandparents, or whoever, and find your roots. Where did your ancestors come from, meaning abroad and when, she smiled. Then the teacher said, we'll stick a pin in it. And so she did. I went home and asked. I received no firm answers, at least none that was satisfactory to a nine-year-old. At that time, there was no DNA to analyze, no Ancestry.com, and Henry Louis Gates had not taught us how to do <laughs> genealogy. <clears throat> but I persisted. Susie sitting next to me not only remembered or knew when her, not remembered, but knew when her great-grandfather came from Ireland, but what town he had lived and a little about his life. When it was my turn, I simply said Africa. The entire homogeneous class of little smiling white children turned and stared as the teacher sticks a pin into the heart I think Ghana or somewhere in the West Coast. I don't imagine she knew that slave ships had curved the Indian Ocean and kidnapped people as far away as Madagascar. As the author recounts in the memories of Madagascar and slavery in the Black Atlantic, the stories particularly invoke tales of kidnapping and primarily of women and children to the North American mid-Atlantic ports during the 18th century. I don't suppose she would know that, nor did I. But she did the best she could. But for me, as I end, this book speaks to larger issues around memory, both collective and individual memory. We ask, I ask, we all might ask, why bother to keep alive a past that is as heinous as it is possibly unprovable and maybe entirely unknowable? In other words, why remember at all? But the past is not really about the past. The past is really about the present. As the American novelist William Faulkner writes, the past is never dead. It's not even past. That's why textbooks can be controversial. They represent the official or the sanctioned narrative of the state. For example, Kobe Burren, 15, a freshman at a suburban Houston high school, was reading 
the geography textbook in his class when a map of the United States caught his attention. On page 126, a caption in a section about immigration referred to Africans brought to American plantations between 15 and 1800 as workers rather than slaves. He reached for his cell phone, sent a photograph, thank God for technology, to his mother, <laughs> along with a text message, and I quote, we was real hard workers, wasn't we? End of quote. <clears throat> As a 2014 fellow at the Eckert International Tech Book Research Organization in Braunschweig, Germany, I have been researching how the black freedom struggle is portrayed in textbooks around mm. the world, including the US. Thus my interest in the fine work of our author here today, I just published an article in their research bulletin. Dr. Wilson's well-received book acknowledges what she calls the burden of memory and the weight of the past and how silence Erasure, what I call the great scrub, mm -hmm. sends a message in its own right. And with that, may the discussion begin. I will announce this later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to open the floor. We'll take two or three questions at a time to prevent a lot of up and down. Um, and so the floor is open to anyone. If you have a question, Oh, sorry. Um, please push the button on your microphone so that we can hear you. Uh, and before you answer the, ask the question, um, please introduce yourself. So. Thank you. Dr. Heller. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually had a couple questions okay. myself. Um, so one question is given now with DNA testing, is that at all helpful in really kind of trying to figure out who has ancestry or had um, or descendants of some of those Malagasy and slave Malagasy? Um, and the second was we're in a timeline, because I know at one point there's a significant Asian migration into Madagascar. And so where in the timeline does that figure in terms of the point in which people are kind of taken and were some of the, is it possible some of the people that were taken were also descendants of some of those Asian migrants that came to Madagascar? Okay. Why don't I answer those three? All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harvey, for your question about what I've uh, noted as nurture and memory. Um, Absolutely, um, the past is about now. And uh, one of the big questions was why, why do people keep, the, why are people still talking about this in the 21st century? And the reason is because it defines, it, it is a way of people defining themselves in an interior way that doesn't depend on the outside community. And I think that um, my hope would really be that there are more young researchers who engage in this type of research um, in the United States, and why not also in the Caribbean? And I don't mean just um, people who are descendants of the old diaspora, people who are descendants of the new diaspora. Um, this ability to name oneself, I think, um, is very empowering, that's what Gomez says in the introduction, 
and I agree with him. It helps people place themselves in the world. And I think it's one of the uh, laments, if I may say, for African Americans when they encounter, uh, as, as the story that was just told, for example, about somebody in the third grade, but also somebody who's 42 visiting Senegal for the first time. And somebody says, and where do you think you're from? Or somebody saying, I'm from Mbur, I'm from, you know, wherever, Kaolak. And the person is, well, I'm, uh, uh, I'm well, uh, I'm, I guess I'm American. Uh, first of all, I'm not, an, I, I, whether somebody is American really it just means so little to me because you're, if you're already of African descent, you're of African descent, whether you're in America or Canada or Panama. So um, very often people say, well, you said, you feel close to Africa, but you're still an American. And I, I think, yes, fine. I'm still an American of African descent. Uh, the problem is people learning how to live with those contradictions. I think those histories that are rather painful. Um, but also the problem, getting back to the textbook thing, that so much of this information does not circulate. It's just amazing how much information doesn't circulate. Like the work that I was talking about recently, you know, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, Paul uh, Lovejoy, uh, Lorena Walsh, Michael Gomez. How much of that makes it to public schools? Hardly anything. So does that mean we have to start our own little schools, neighborhood schools again? Maybe, uh, for people to feel closer to their history. And, and I'm gonna use your question to go to the DNA question. Um, as I was working on this book, um, I was also recording another story of somebody who currently lives in Washington. And um, she shared the information with a woman named Teresa Vega, who lives in New York, who is uh, one part parent is Puerto Rican and one parent is African American. She also had a story of Madagascar and she did a DNA test. When she did the DNA test, she had Malagasy on both sides of her family. And um, on the American side, she's actually descended from the son of Robert King Carter, whose plantations we saw on this map. She, her family was at Shirley Plantation near Richmond, Virginia. So she started a private a Facebook page called Malagasy Roots. And that Facebook page is for people who either have done a DNA test or have a story in their families about Madagascar. Um, for me, I was very relieved because I named certain families in Virginia that I had been, t who told me that they had Malagasy heritage, such as particularly the Raglands, and the Carters and the Fitzhughes. Uh, and lo and behold, when the people on the Malagasy Roots Facebook page got together, did DNA <laughs> results, there were black people who were Raglands, Randolphs, Carters, and Fitzhughes, who not only had Malagasy origins, but were related to each other and didn't even know it. So DNA can be useful. In another instance, uh, somebody who, in the States found a relative in St. Helena's Island in the South Atlantic, which is particularly poignant, I think, because ships used to have to drop off a few of their slaves in St. Helena's on their way to the uh, Eastern United States. So that indicates that somebody from the same village or the same family, they were separated there at, uh, at St. Helena's. Um, and there have been a couple of cases where Americans have found relatives either in Madagascar or even France. But I also think it's very dangerous because you, you are not simply your biological self. And just as nobody, what you know, the terrible thing that has happened to African Americans is that reality keeps slippery, slipping around. So that it, once you sort of attune yourself to one reality, another reality is asserted. Nobody's past is completely known. But we somehow think we have to super prove 
our past. There are no group of people in the world who complete who can completely prove their past. So uh, we should not be too bothered if we can't completely prove ours either. But what is dangerous is to think that that uh, identity is totally built on material foundations. Um, when I was in Senegal, sometimes I would meet African Americans. I remember in particular somebody I met who was very upset because he felt very Senegalese and he found out he was only, you know, one eighth Senegalese or something like that. And, you know, there's such a thing as a cultural identity. You know, we have to imagine what happened to the Africans who came to the United States. What about the Igbo child who was brought up by Senegambians? Or the Malagasy child who had one, uh, or somebody of Malagasy descent who was shipped to a Congo family. Those are the type of things that happen in the United States. So we have to be able to live with a kind of ambiguity and um, a, a comfort with sort of moving information and different kinds of information. And I would even argue that this country has a very um, rigid history of identities that is not really the same any place else in the world. So what we take as a universal truth is merely a United States custom, if, and that's all it is. So who is white and who is black is nothing but a United States custom. Really, that's all it is. Uh, who is uh, African and who is not has also been debate since the time African Americans uh, came to the United States. In terms of timelines in Madagascar, the mixed, and that's also a very political issue in Madagascar, but um, the people that we call Malagasy uh, evolved on the East African coast, is what people think now. It's what historians and archaeologists and linguists think now. Uh, through the mixture of African, uh, I hate, I don't have any other term, please forgive me, Bantu, uh, peoples in East Africa, and people who came from Sumatra and Java principally in Indonesia. They mixed and created a new group of people. Those people migrated to the island of Madagascar, and I think in the first instance, only a few people survived. So there were several waves of people who came, uh, who mixed and created the Malagasy people. And this happened like 2,000 years ago. So there is no Malagasy people who are not Malagasy, so to speak. They're all Malagasy. They all speak different dialects. And um, by the time this, the, uh, actually the first slaves from Madagascar came into the Americas in the 1690s. Many were sent to Montreal. Uh, and they have, they, some came to Virginia, just a few, but they were already speaking the Malagasy language, which is a mixture of um, an Aust Austronesian family. Uh, it is, uh, got a lot of Bantu African borrowings, has some Arabic borrowings, and then different parts of the island. Some people are a little bit more Indian. Uh, some people are a little bit more Arabic, just to having to do with the trade winds and and how uh, commerce went on. So um, the United, I, I wanted to say something that I forgot to say, if I may, just very quickly. Um, so I, right now I'm looking at sailors because I have several stories of people who came in the 1830s who were free and came with white sponsors. They know the names of the white sponsors. Some of them claim to have gone back to Cape Town uh, working on the ships of these people. Others went back to Madagascar itself, and their descendants are here in the U.S., but they are not on the record. I, I have not found yet any evidence of their existence, but um, I do have evidence of the families that they're talking about. So most recently, uh, we've be, been doing research on copal, which is a West Indian commodity, uh, Indian Ocean commodity, and we have linked those names of the white merchants with Copal. So uh, in June, I'm gonna come down and go to the customs archives to see if there I can find any 
uh, crew lists to try to add a little bit more credibility to the, uh, the sailor stories. Another set of questions? Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm Judy Morlatta from the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film. Thank you so much for this important work. It is just absolutely incredible. Uh, and I'm so fascinated by what you're doing and what you continue to do. Um, I, wanted, I wonder if you could just talk, because one of the things that you said at the very beginning was this kind of challenge between <clears throat> the written society and the uh, a writing society yes. and a non-writing society. And all the way through, you have honored and recognized the importance of history and memory coming from both sides, mm -hmm. which is not something that usually happens. Uh, and of course, there are scholars who have talked about this. Mm -hmm. uh, Pierre no uh, Nora mm -hmm. um, talks about it, yes. and Bob O'Mealy and right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, others uh, talk about Lou de Menoir. Yeah, not saying that's right. right. Anyway, but they talk about the, the fact that 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 everybody owns history and has a right to tell it. And I think that in what you are doing, you are honoring both both sides of that. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about any conflicts you have encountered as you have tried to do this. <laughs> You know. uh, because it is not a common way that scholarship looks at this, and t and usually what happens is that the written society, the history and memories that come from the writing society side, would be privileged above right. the other. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Hi. 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 My name is Ebony. And I wanted to um, speak about um, this um, African that came on a, a slave ship, like that wasn't documented. Um, like last year, I was busy with my family history, and that's when I found out that a lot of African that wasn't documented um, went to African Town, which was mm -hmm. located in Alabama, and that's where my family originated from. And I learned a lot of my history from there. And so my question to you is, um, um, how do I go about learning more of my history um, so I can educate the rest of my family? Mm -hmm. You could both turn off your, make sure you're OK, thank you um, for those questions. I'm going to answer the, the slavery question first. Um, and thank you for posing that question. Um, I don't know if you're aware of a book called Dreaming of Af Dreams of Africa and Alabama, but I think you want to start with that book by Sylvian Diouf, D-I-O-U-F. Um, she did some incredible research uh, tracking uh, the history of some black families in Alabama who were among the last Africans to be brought into the United States. So Alabama has a very special history in that regard. And I'm, I don't know if your family is connected to that history or not, but it might be very interesting for you to read the book because she talked to contemporary African Americans and traced their history all the way back to Ouida in, in Benin. Um, unfortunately, in the early 19th century, many slave traders were making jokes and um, dares with each other about whether or not they could still go out and bring Africans back into the United States. So um, there, if the people were smuggled, it's very hard uh, to find out how they got in. That's what I faced. But what you have to do is you have to trace the white people's history and their papers. And it's a very tedious job, and you have to be prepared for the fact you may never, ever find what you're looking for. But what you're looking for is the oldest name you know in your family, the oldest first name, whatever it is, even if it looks like it's not a name. It could be Kiki or Didi or whatever it is. You have to get the oldest name, and then you have to go to the last plantation that your family was at and try to work your way forward. So you're working your way backward 
through family history, and you're working your way forward through written documents. And if you're lucky, you can find a meeting point. And sometimes you have to actually go to that place and interview people who remember your family. Your own family may not remember certain things, but neighbors might if they haven't moved around too much. But really try to get Sylvian Juke's book, Dreams of Africa in Alabama. About um, history, uh, the name that I was trying to remember earlier was Natalie Zeman Davis, who uh, did this great paper called Fuzzy Studies. And that was sort of like my Bible as I was working on this book, because I was doing such a fuzzy study. But I learned so much from historians, and um, I think I was very lucky. I think for several reasons. One is that because I had already been an active scholar in African studies, so I had already built up certain kinds of networks. So when I started working on this, I went as a student to my fellow scholars who were historians and said, this is what I'm trying to do. What do you think of it? How do I do this? So I didn't run into a big uh, conflict because, uh, well, I did a book chapter in one of Lovejoy's collections first. And I talked about how I use the internet to connect with a lot of these narratives that I was getting. And then when I did my first draft, um, some of my readers, were aghast because I had mixed history with ethnography. And uh, I had made assumptions and presumptions and the brouhaha, you know, and, oh my God. But um, I thought I took it as a challenge because I felt that just as you've just said, it points to this problem. I can't get away from that challenge of orality and different kinds of truths. So what I decided to do, as uh, those who've read the book will know, each chapter has a history section and an ethnography section. So the history section pulls together all the documented information that I could find. And the ethnographic section pulls together all the information I got from interviews and online conversations. And the interesting thing is that the, fur the closer I got uh, from the past to the present, in the past, the history section was bigger and the narratives were very small because people didn't remember much. They might, it was very anecdotal. My great-great-grandmother was from Madagascar or whatever. Then as closer you got to the 1830s, the history part was very small, but people had very big narratives because it was not so long ago. So that's where I got the narratives about people going to, I'm so sorry people going to um, Cape Town and, and things like that. So that, that's how I solved it, by trying to toggle between the historical context and the oral history, the family history. We have time for two more questions. Dr. Chum, and then anyone else? Okay, the gentleman. Okay. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to follow up on the uh, question and comment that Dr. Uh, Moulada made and regarding also the, the sort of theoretical and methodological challenges she was involved in uh, doing this work here. And I think in the text that she references, uh, the one by O'Malley and, and, and Genevieve Park, they, they, they look at this issue of history and memory and try to <coughs> sort of explore this hierarchy that tends to be established, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when, when, when people talk about history, and history seen as uh, in the conventional sense of, you know, written stuff, that when it, if it's not written, it's not, it's not correct, valid, correct. Yeah. you know. So they try to sort of uh, break that hierarchy and establish some kind of hierarchy between, uh, you know, history as understood conventionally and memory, which usually is 
tied to or equated with the order. So, so I think um, in, 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 in terms of you know, the methodological implications of your work, I think it's, it's, it's really key you know, to, 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 to sort of uh, tease that out, to get that out of your, um, uh, of your, of your work. And I think it, 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 it really continues you know, this uh, uh, argument of uh, uh, O'Malley and, 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 and Park, mm -hmm. the importance mm -hmm. of really getting away from those hierarchies. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the other, you mentioned uh, fuzzy, fuzzy study. And I, I mean, it, it, it sort of piqued an interest in me because I have a colleague here in the Department of Economics, ah. you know, who, who has done quite a lot of work on, 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 on fuzzy theory, you know, which somehow is also related to fractals. Yes. You know, some of these things that are very yes. contemporary in contemporary theory. And again, these are things that uh, sort of point to some of the things that you are observing here, the instability, the indeterminacy that, 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 that attends to much of what we do, especially when it comes to history and historical, uh, historical memory, when you made the comment that you know, there's no society that can, can really have a total history, you know, uh, when you look at Mbembe and the others, you know, I mean, what they're really looking at are these micro histories you know, what Park and Omali call the multiplicity of memory. Yes. Which, which, which are all sort of equally, uh, equally valued. So, I mean, these are all things that I really draw from your work. You know, they were quite astounding. Thank you. I, I wanted much. to ask you, though, when, if in your work you, I mean, do you find any movement east from Madagascar? Like, you know, oh, similar yeah. to what happened in the... Yes, in the, it's in a very Indian sad Indian story. Uh, uh, of course, um, a lot of Malagasy were taken to um, Mauritius. So many that, um, if you read... Uh, um, uh, what's his name? At the Hopkins, the historian. He, he talks about how um, there were so many Malagasy in Mauritius that Malagasy was a second language besides... Mauritian Creole, Pierre Larson, writes about this a lot. And he's written a lot about Malagasy as a maritime language. And, and that really uh, deserves more research because nobody else has, has done that research. But the Mal Malagasy were also taken, of course, to South Africa. And I, it was uh, here that I learned about uh, Weinberg, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to go do a study there sometime where there are a lot of Malagasy Creoles historically. But the Malagasy were taken by the thousands to work in the pepper plantations of Indonesia by the Dutch. So that's like really, you talk about the irony of history. So these people are, are themselves sort of Indonesian Creoles, if you will, uh, Creolized between the Indonesians and the Africans. And they've developed their own uh, culture, and then they get reshipped back to Indonesia, to to uh, Sumatra, to work on the pepper pepper plantations for the Dutch in the 17th century. And they probably found that it was to their advantage because they could learn the language quickly. So they were actually shipped as slaves. But thank you so much for your discussion about what you say about the whole problem of indeterminacy and and time and so forth. I've really been going back to Mbembe uh, to try to grapple with some of those ideas um, about a structure and epistemologies. And he has this great idea of optic ontologies, which I really enjoy because he talks about how in America in particular, but in the West in general, people have been living off of the surface of things. So in case, instead of engaging the face, they engage a coated surface. So if the surface is coated as black, then they don't actually engage with the person, they engage with the code. So I mean, Mbembe is so dense, you know, but so I try to read him several times and I'm, now reading him again to try to uh, 
learn how to talk about some of these things. So thank you very much. Wendy, uh, I don't wish to comment on the last discussion because historians of Thailand will not discuss it. Particularly <laughs> African historians and Western historians. I think history started in the West, to be really clear. <laughs> the definition of history is very important. Yes. I think it's a study and a collection of the past. What may be important to discuss is preservation. If your perception is one interpretation of, of preservation, writing, what is history, most important history, was not written, mm -hmm. including the Bible and the Quran. Mm -hmm. But we don't go in there. <laughs> For example, the whole discussion of written and unwritten you know, you, know, you have a book written society without society that with that without witness. But these are I think these are these are very good concepts on the eve of conquest and colonization. Mm -hmm. And it continues the battle. Mm -hmm. History they could not be at the same level. But that's I leave that it is wonderful for non historians. <laughs> Join us in the story. <laughs> so my questions are, Wendy, where do you see yourself? With the Wadabe and Malagasy. <laughs> I remember I'm a graduate, these are your two things. That's one. <laughs> the second thing I want to ask you is, when we're talking about Africans, dropped from North America, educated in Africa, Reason, you know, it's easy, people have discussed it, but I studied the Southeast, as you know, the Gala and the Gichi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, these were not just the bundle of naked Africans in the jungle box. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Southeast, particularly in the Gala, Gichi area, slavers were very white, entrepreneurs, as usual, they brought people who produce rice. Mm -hmm. And in my story, one of the arguments is the dry rice in the Southeast, some aspect of it was credited to Malagasy. But you found out the uses, because they didn't bring them just to be good, but mm -hmm. or salad. Right. There must be something equivalent to rice producers mm -hmm. as happened in the Southeast. Okay. And that's that's very important. So those are my two little questions. Thank you so much, Koto Alpha. Um, I'm going to start with your last question first. Um, in the late 1600s. Over 40% of the slave population in Barbados was from Madagascar. And within 50 years, the people who settled South Carolina were mostly British settlers from Barbados. So I think that the people they, that they brought with them were probably uh, at least 50% uh, first or second generation Malagasy people. Um, and I think that was a bigger proposition then because they had the rice that came with the people when they on the same ships and they were trying to grow rice in South Carolina. But as you know, um, those technologies were superseded by the Mandinka uh, rice uh, technologies in South Carolina and